Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, well, I would and greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you here to our to our table at Bible Talk, where each week we gather to feed, to feast on the Word of God. So, yeah, so we're blessed that you can be with us as we continue our study in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is our eighth week in that study, our eighth chapter, so to speak, and we're glad that you can be with us. And again, I'll remind you, you may be here for the first time, that you can go back here on the Bible Talk website and see all of the prior studies. We keep them archived as we're doing the study. So, before we start, let me ask Brother Mark here to lead us in a prayer, ask God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we just thank you for the ability to get together. I just pray that we hear from you, and then you guide the study, and you put the words in the mouth of Butch, and open our ears and our hearts to hear what we need to hear, and apply it to our lives. Amen. 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 Um, I also want to remind you that while, unfortunately, we can't dialogue as we do this, mm -hmm. which I would much prefer to be doing, uh, and you're welcome to stop by and be with us on Friday nights. Just write to me at office at BibleTalk.com. I'll tell you how to get here. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, we also welcome those. Office at BibleTalk.com. All right, as I mentioned, we're in our eighth week in our study of uh, First Thessalonians. And we're starting off tonight in chapter 3. It's taken us seven weeks to do the first two chapters. Okay. All right, so let moving me, right along. Moving right along. Because, again, and I always have to say this, I'll say two things, are my items of business. Test business. everything that I say. Don't take my word for anything. Test it and make sure that it is the word of God. Okay, that's your responsibility. What's the second thing? I don't know. Was there two things? Probably. If I think of it, I'll let you know. <laughs> Um, we really encourage take you. Take notes. To, that's a good idea. Take mm -hmm. notes. Bible study is, is a good time to take notes, yeah. right? Um, because sometimes we may go a little too fast in, in our scripture references and everything. So that, that's a good idea. The other thing is, take what you hear this evening or whenever you're watching this and, and chew on it. Think about it. Meditate. Meditate on it through the week. Talk to the Lord about it. That's the most important thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I think my job here is to try and throw things out that plant a seed in you that only, you know, it says one, one plants and other waters, but it's God that gives the growth. And it's the same thing here as we go into the Word. It's only God that's going to grow that Word in you. That's right. All right? And the other thing was, now that I remember, now it's like the fourth thing, um, is that while we're doing a study of First Thessalonians, what we're doing a study of is the Word of God. And Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Our purpose in all of this, remember it says that Paul wrote, the goal of our instruction is love. Mm -hmm. He is love. God is love. Yes, he is. So what we're really praying is that we would see Jesus more clearly. So we're not in a rush to get through here. Because it's not about just reading this one letter of Paul's. It is about seeing Jesus Christ and then seeing Jesus Christ at work in our lives more and more clearly. All right. So let me read this. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Let me, let me just, well, let me, let me read one more verse. For indeed we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass as you know. What couldn't Paul endure? He says, you know, therefore when we could endure it no longer. 
what he couldn't endure was his physical separation from this church this, that God had used him to start this body of believers, this congregation that the Lord had used him to build in Thessalonica. He was, after, after only three weeks, that church was established. But then he was literally kind of run out of town and went from there to Berea, from Berea to Thessalonica, right? Can I just interject something? Um, I don't know if people in the churches today can get a sense of that because being in a smaller group, in a smaller church, it is such family-oriented and, and there's such a closeness and an, an intense. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Also, when um, a church started, there they were separated from the Jews, so it was them and the Jews, whether they, whether the Jews were hostile to them or not, because they believed something different than those people of like faith clung together. Yeah. Well, you're right. and that was just a small group. Okay, well, no, okay. But the, th the thing that concerns me is, um, I'm trying to think of what you just said. Uh, they, they weren't starting something new. Paul was bringing revelation of the Scripture to the Jews. To the Jews first, mm -hmm. okay? But the Jews would consider it new and different. I'm, I understand uh, your point. Uh, no more so than they would have considered the Sermon on the Mount new. In spite of the fact that everything that Jesus taught. Jesus didn't teach new stuff. Jesus gave insight into old stuff. This is why I have a problem to a great degree with what's called dispensationalism. You know, that it's like, okay, let's throw the Old Testament kind of, throw it out. It's a second class scripture. Well, back then. Well, wait a minute. Wait, 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 it, this, the Old Testament is not second class scripture. When Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, all scripture is God-breathed. He's talking about from Genesis to Malachi. Right? He's talking about all those scriptures. What, what Jesus brought was he revealed the truth of scripture that, that people had not seen. Paul is revealing the truth of scripture to the Jews as he goes to these places. And without doubt, I mean, many Jews understood this and saw it and accepted Christ as the Messiah that had been promised from the beginning of time. From, from the time that Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. God had made it clear that he was going to provide this, this redemption for them. And that redemption, it became clear, was through his, his own son, the promised Messiah of Israel. But I thought you were talking about like the relationship that they well, had. Okay, no, I, I was, but that, it's kind of gone there. Um, church is supposed to be a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, church is not not uh, a corporation. It's not an organization. It is a family affair. Mm -hmm. We've we've taught this so many times, and probably. Well, thousands of times more, should the Lord tarry, and he doesn't take me ahead of time here, that if you're a Baptist, uh, uh, Assemblies of God, Church of God, Presbyterian, whatever you are, if that's what you do is denominationalism, let me just say this. The Spirit of God will not bear witness to that. That's the vision in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 8 says this, For the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The church is not more than a family. It started with Abraham. And the promise to Abraham was that God would give him all of these children. It became a family. Yes. <laughs> and we should have that family relationship in a body of Christ. I've said this a lot of times because those of you who know me know that I'm not a great fan of really large churches. Mm -hmm. One of the primary reasons being is that people don't know one another. And I said, I don't know what the right size. I can't, I'm not going to put a number on this. I'm not even going to mention the fact that in the Gospel of Mark, you know, when Jesus did this thing, he, he divided them into fifties and hundreds. Well, that's another story. But I should be able to walk into any congregation, and somebody in that congregation should be able to introduce me to every other person in that congregation. Because if you don't know each other, you don't have the relationship 
that Jesus Christ died on the cross to make. You should have that intimate relationship with God the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And you should have a familial, a family relationship with everybody in that congregation. That's what it's about. It's not just, okay, people that pass you on Sundays, you know, going one way or another. So, and Alice is absolutely right. When you have that bond that we are supposed to have, separation hurts. Yes. The same way, yes. you know, we're, we're living in a time of, a time of war. We've had war for 10 years in the United States of America when so many households are broken up because guys are overseas fighting, which, by the way, is the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I grew into manhood during the Vietnam. They call it, you know, the Vietnam War. Call it what it was. The Korean War. Call it, it wasn't a police action. It was war. My dad, I mean, I, I was born during the time of the Second World War. Generation after generation after generation, the, the young men go off to fight the battles. I'm not going there, but it breaks the family. You know what suffering that causes, what, what hardship and suffering that causes for the people that are separated. Well, if you don't feel that, when, you don't, you know, when you're not fellowshipping with that family of God that the Lord has brought you into, then you don't have a right relationship with him. There's something missing. Right? So Paul had this. Paul had this. He calls Timothy his son in the faith. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was like, you know, because God used him to bring Timothy into the fullness of ministry. There's pain and separation. We do this for the same reason that men go to war. Mm -hmm. You know, you fulfill your ministry. But Paul had been with these people in, the, in Thessalonica for a brief period of time. And yet during that brief period of time, it was an incredible happening because he stirred up the town so much that, I mean, people were being saved, Gentile and Jew were being saved. Mm -hmm. And then he was literally, because of those apostles, those Jews who would not receive the Messiah, literally caused so much trouble that he had to leave the town. And I'm just going to kind of do something different tonight. And, and let's just kind of wander around these verses a little bit more. Because you know we're going to we're going to talk about the afflictions. Mm -hmm. In this very verse, it talks about, um, or in the next verse, right, in three and four, it talks about how they were disturbed by the afflictions. One of the reasons they they suffered such affliction is because they were perceived as rejecting the political system in their time. Now, this is really really a touchy subject particularly in the United States of America, particularly in this day. But that's exactly, if, let me go back here a little bit, uh, in Acts chapter 17. I'm going to pop right back to Acts 17. You can turn, by the way, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, you should be close to that as we read along, regardless of what translation you're using. If your translation doesn't sound quite like what I'm saying, then you better take a look at that. All right. So, when Paul went to, uh, let me define this here now. Why are you looking for that? In verse 3, it says in my Bible that, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. That's, yeah. But my footnote says, or deceived. That's a, that's a big difference. Okay. In Thessalonica, when the Jews stirred up the trouble, mm -hmm. and by the way, they dragged in Gentiles. They went into the, the streets and got a mob to come after them. What was the accusation that they made against Paul and his preaching? I'll answer the question for you since you don't have it at hand, all right? Um, I'm going to start in, in Acts 17, verse 6 and 7 is what I'm going to read. This is when they come seeking Paul, right, this mob. They said when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason. Now, Jason is one of the people who got saved, right? And some brethren before the city authorities shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Talking about Paul and Silas slash Sylvanus, all right? And we talked about that last weekend yes. in the study there.
But listen to this next verse. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. In other words, what were they accused of? One word. What were they accused of? Treason. Treason. That's exactly the word. That's exactly the word that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And you want to know something? They were right. They were right. Because what Paul was proclaiming is that there is one king. There is a king of kings. There is a lord of lords. This was an amazingly large problem for the early church particularly when, during certain periods of time, the Caesars in Rome would insist that everybody in the nation, as a test of loyalty, would, would proclaim Caesar as Lord. And these Christians refused to do that, because they said, there's one Lord, and his name is Jesus Christ. So they were, the, the crime that they were committing was put in the context of being a political, they rejected the political setting of their time. Because that's what they were being taught. Now, what they were not being taught was to rebel against that authority. To the contrary, they were being taught to pray for that authority and be submitted to that authority. So they weren't rebellious, but they were stating the truth, a fact that is true, was true then and is equally as true today. There is only one king. There is one. And all of the rulers of the world have, their hearts are in the hand of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes back, that's what you're going to see, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The, the Jews and the uh, Gentiles in the area, must, you know, when they heard the Christians talk about this, must have been really confused because it seems not to make sense. Because the Christians were saying, even that we don't agree with you, we will obey what you say because you're you're the king that God has authorized. Well, it's 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 here's the deal, and the suggestion is true today. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually praised. If I go out and I talk to people today and say that I don't participate in the world's political system, regardless of where I am, that, that raises the hackles oh of most Christians that I know, at least equal to the way that the Jews were, were irked by the preaching and teaching of the Apostle Paul. Because I still say there is only one king, there is only one Lord. All right. Well, let me let me let's just go on. But I wanted to I wanted to get that. You need to understand, because a lot of times we just read over these scriptures without understanding the situation at the time. They were being accused. The reason that Paul was forced out of Thessalonica was he was being accused of treason, political treason, because he was saying that there was another king beside the Caesar. They, they, listen, people want to praise things spiritually. they got to put it in it. And the Jews who rejected Jesus Christ, they were not spiritual. Oh, they were very religious. Earthly. And they were very political. They were political and they were religious. But they were not spiritual and they didn't have a right relationship with God the Father because they rejected the only way you can have a right relationship with God the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. But Paul's heart was pained because of the physical separation that he had. Now remember, he's still being very active. Mm -hmm. the, the chances are good, and, and the assumption is that Paul wrote this from Corinth. Now when he left Thessalonica, he went to Berea, had trouble in Berea, because the Jews from Thessalonica chased him to Berea to stir up trouble there. Right? Mm -hmm. Then he goes to Athens, and if you know the story in, in Athens, he winds up you know, speaking before the entire city, causing another massive uproar. That's what they said. This is the man that turned the world upside down. Oh, yes, he did. And he did the same thing in Athens, so he left Athens and he went to Corinth. So from Corinth, he writes this letter. But now in Corinth, he's very busy. I mean, he spent a year and a half in Corinth teaching and building this church. 
So, you know, it's like, why can't he go? One reason he can't go is he can't leave the work that he's doing in Karn. But his heart is still with everybody that he's been used. I can appreciate this. Yes. I mean, you know, Alice and I have been traveling for years and years and years. And we travel all over the place. Um, you know people in Africa and I know Britain, people in Africa. France. I know people in France and England and in, in, in Latin America. I know people, you know, in, in Israel. And my heart is with these people. And Alice can tell you, I mean, you know, I would love to be back with all these people face to face. Yeah. Thank God for the technology that we have and that we're using right here, right now. It's great to be able to reach out. But it's not, it's not the same. a great substitute for being eyeball to eyeball. Right. One of the things it says in here, it says, Therefore, when I could endure it no long, longer in chapter 3, verse 1, and then also in verse 5, for this mm -hmm. reason, when I could endure it no longer. It's the... I, I see him not seeing that church kind of just out there with nobody to, to teach it. No, oh, no, 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 He's sending what he does because he can't leave. Now he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. Right. All right. And it says here. You sent what, Timothy, our brother. Mm -hmm. Right. But for a purpose. To strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And in five that you just talked about, he said, I also sent to find out about your faith. Right. All right. So now he's like. So it's a two way communication that okay. he wants. So let's just talk about what you just said for, for a minute here. Do you honestly think that Paul, who taught about the fact that God has appointed in the church yeah. apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of service, Paul, who talked about God being a God of good order, not a God of confusion, Paul, who instructed Titus to go out and appoint elders and pastors in all of the places, do you think that even in that brief period of time, he left that church with nobody in charge? No. And you would be right. He, he did the best he could with what he had. Well, he, remember, he's, he's forced to leave the town faster than he would have liked to, right? It's like kind of just, whoop, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, but, no. but regardless of that, I'm, I'm telling you that Paul would not leave them unattended. In this letter, if you went up to verse chapter 5, you would find this. In chapter 5, Verse 12, he said, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. So, so there's somebody there. So there's somebody there. Paul would not abandon them in chaos. But he wanted to give them more, so instead yes. of going back, they, he sent Timothy. Right, because remember, the people that he has left in charge are, are new believers. Right. Okay? Right. Right? So, so now... They need to be strengthened and encouraged. All right. They need to be. But this is a good point. I mean, you know, we've done mission work for years and years and years and years and years, decades. And, and I've shared this here before, and certainly Mark and Alice know this. You know, I, can, I think one really great example was I was going to West Africa one time without Alice, which is unusual. And during the course of that trip, which is a very, very long trip to get from Orlando, Florida, to New York, to London, to Paris, to West Africa it was that route. And that entire time, I'm praying, you know, Lord, why are you sending me? Now, a lot of guys, listen, you may be a missionary out there watching this, and you've got a down pat. Bless you. I, I don't have a down pat yet, and I've been doing this for three and a half decades. Because sometimes it's like, you know, okay, I'm going. But you want to know something? When I was going to West Africa, they have the Bible in West Africa. They have pastors. They have teachers. They have the Holy Spirit. Why do they need me? And this is kind of the question I have. Why, why did Paul have to send somebody to strengthen their faith if he had left people who were giving them instruction and teaching them behind? And here's, let me just share this. What God said to me when I went to Africa, he said, I'm sending you because you'll say the things they don't want to hear. 
God has, God is a God of good order. God has a structure. And that structure is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We don't, in most of the church today, the church and even the imitation church, amongst the wheat and the tares, it's, it's, it's rare to find a right relationship with apostles. Congregations either have some kind of outside leadership that's organizational and not apostolic. The largest Pentecostal denomination today has rejected apostles as being not for this time. And I don't understand the logic of that because then why not reject all of the scriptures and say let's go back and pick out what we like for this time. But that's another story. Many of the cults have quote-unquote apostles because they have people lording it over them rather than serving them. Right? Apostles don't serve a congregation. They serve all of the congregations that God puts them in touch with. Right? Pastors and teachers, even evangelists, can be local to a single congregation, to a body. Prophets, not necessarily so. Prophets, typically not so. And apostles, absolutely not so. They don't answer to a congregation. Authority flows from the top down, right? Mm -hmm. So we're missing that in the body of Christ today. We're missing this right structure. Why? Because the devil has had 2,000 years to, to play and cultivate his evil inside the church, where people are afraid of authority or they are under bondage to his authority. I mean, it's just all out of balance. We need to get back to that place where we seek God and seek his instruction to get the function of the church working properly. The needs, if you have a church and there is no, and you don't know, recognize apostolic authority in that body, then either one or thing, two things is true. The, the Bible is a lie, and he hasn't appointed apostles in that body. Can't buy that one. Don't, don't buy that one. Or you're not recognizing the work of God in your congregation. In other words, I'm saying that he has appointed an apostle or apostles in, to work with that, that congregation. And if you don't recognize it, you're not recognizing what God has done. The same thing is true. When I talk about prophets, I'm not talking about some of the stuff that's going on today. Where people, I mean, it's like the Christian psychic hotline. Oh, 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 God wants you rich. If God wanted you rich, why didn't he tell you to buy Microsoft 10 years ago? 15 or 20. Yeah. Or 15 or 20. And sell it. Why, why, you know, if he wanted you rich, it's not a big task for God. Mm. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. He could have sent you a couple of cows. God wants you rich in spirit. God wants you to have life and have it abundantly. He wants you to have joy and that your joy should be made full. And if you think it comes from the stuff that so, that so many preachers from so many pulpits are preaching every Sunday, you've been deceived. So Paul knew this. Paul knew you need solid instruction in the Word of God. And he wanted this young church to have that solid instruction. Discipleship is a process. And this is what Jesus Christ called the church to do. This is the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Go out into all the world, preaching the gospel, baptizing, and instructing them to be obedient to the commands of God. So discipleship is a viral kind of thing. It's like Paul instructed Timothy and made a disciple of Timothy. Now Timothy goes back and he does the work. Passing on. It goes from person to person. That's the way it's supposed to work. It wasn't... It, you know, it's almost like today... Oh, gosh, I... I I'm not getting far today. Ramble. I, I ramble. But I ramble with a purpose. Alice and I were talking about college the other day, just because of the whole situation with the economy. And there are so many colleges out there, for-profit small colleges, that are doing really, really well. I don't know how well they do for the people that go there. I'm sure some people go there, get blessed, get educated. But they're getting funded because they have access to, to financial assistance from the U.S. government for these students. So they get money from the government for, for doing this. Everybody's going to college today. When I was a young man, not everybody went to college. It was, you know, the majority of people did not go to college. Right? right? The vast majority of people didn't go to college. And the quality of education was entirely different. Now, I went to a private high school, an all-boys Catholic college prep school. 
And when I got through there, I chose not to go straight to college. I did, however, go into the Navy and wanted to fly. And one of the things back there is, you know what a GED is, a, a general education diploma. equivalency diploma? Yeah. Right? One of the first things I did when I went into the Navy is I took it, they had college level GEDs. So I graduated from high school, I went straight to the Navy and basically straight to the Navy and took a college level GED and passed that with flying colors. I mean, I was in like the 97th percentile or something. That was from the high school education I had. Now, having gone back and gone to college, I will tell you, I've, gone, I've done master's work and graduate work in a Catholic seminary. That, I, and I say this, I'm going to say this unapologetically. What I see in most liberal art colleges today is they're not getting the education I got in high school. That's right. And yet billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars are being spent on this education. You know, what, what they used to have when I was a young man, and this is where I was going, was apprenticeship programs. If you were working in a trade, any kind of trade, you went out and you did an apprentice program. You know what that's called in the scripture? Discipleship. You would be, an apprentice would be assigned to a master, and that master would educate and treat and, and teach and train somebody in that chosen profession. Well, that's what Christianity is supposed to be. It's not about college. You know, that's what they said about Jesus. Where did this man get his education? Same thing about the apostles. Where did these guys get trained? They got trained in an apprenticeship program, hands-on with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. What did they say? Because they perceived that they were with Christ. Yeah. So, you know, we, we need to start examining where we are. Uh, I've said this before, and, I, you know, I didn't originate this, and actually I don't think anybody knows where it came from. Christianity started as a fellowship in Jerusalem. It became a philosophy in Greece. It became a culture in Rome, and it became an enterprise in America, in the West. What's a fellowship? Is that a family? A fellowship is family. Oh. It's, it's a fellowship. Right? It's a family. That's the way it started. So, Paul had this. We need that relationship. We need to get back into relationships with people. And there needs to be, this is why Paul sent Timothy to to help encourage them and build up their faith. Because God's plan, for, listen, if you don't like God's plan, take that up with him, don't take that up with me. If you have a problem with God's plan, do not write office at BibleTalk.com. Go into your prayer closet and get in touch. With you. And that's that's great, because you can get direct line straight to God. Mm. Jesus on the main line. So anyhow, It's important because, regard, you know, I, I go around, we travel, and I go to places, I've been to places all over the world, and people look at me with a big smile on their face, and they say with great pride, oh, we have a New Testament church. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, oh, which one? Galatians, the Corinthians, which one are you? Berea? No, really, there were a lot of troubles back in the New Testament church. Not from Berea. No, not, not from Maria. And the reason that there wasn't trouble from Maria was that they tested everything according to the Word of God, against the Word of God, to make sure that it was true. And that was the Old Testament that they were testing against it. Well, that's because, you know, I, I don't even like the terms Old Testament and New Testament. I understand that there's a different covenant. There's an Old Covenant and there's a New Covenant. The New Covenant is re revealed all through the time of the, what we call the Old, the Old Testament, right? But all Scripture is God-breathed. All scripture. I, 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 will, I do not have a problem with people that love red letter Bibles. And they talk to me, they've got the words of Jesus in red. Well, I've got all of the words of God in black. Um, it's all God breathed. And we need to understand that. Okay. Whew. We need to get back to that place where we are seeking God through His Word which leads us in paths of righteousness, which is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Did I say right this time? <laughs> For instruction on how we are to live this thing we call Christianity. For God has given us, as Peter says, everything pertaining to life and godliness. We need to get back to it. All right. 
So anyhow, they need to be strengthened and encouraged in their faith. Uh, I, I've gotten in the habit, I, I don't know if I shared this here, I was talking to somebody else, you know, I, I go out and I preach in a lot of different churches, and it is common in a lot of, a lot of times, it doesn't happen every time, not by any means, but it says, you know, the Word of God says in Proverbs that the Word of God is healing to the whole body. And at the end of a, a when I'm preaching, I, w I would often ask people, does anybody here need prayer? A at which time, you know, I and the pastor or some other people would, would pray with people that were in need of prayer. And after all these years of doing that, this, this year, I mean, God gave me a revelation. So I stood up, I think it was in Manchester, I was preaching in Manchester, England, and I stood up at the end of the sermon, I said, is there anybody here stupid enough to think you don't need prayer? Because if you are watching this right now, and you think you don't need the prayer and support of the other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, you're being foolish. You're being foolish indeed. We all need that prayer support from one another. This is why it says pray for one another. Why we're supposed to pray without ceasing. We need each other. That's why this family relationship is so important. Paul recognized the need, even though they had teachers and instructors, you know, those people in the church at Thessalonica. It was a burden on his heart to get somebody back that was in that apostolic structure. So he sent Timothy. Okay. Let, me, let me move along here. So in verses 3 and 4, let me read that. So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. Now, when he says we here, to no one be just by these afflictions, it's hard to tell from the context whether he's talking about the afflictions that he is personally suffering, or that all the Christians are. Because trust me, at this point in time, that church in Thessalonica is being persecuted, as are many of the churches. Why? Because they are counterculture. They are totally, absolutely counterculture. And you'll see how important this is as we get deeper into this letter. All right? And and the idea, what did, did you say something about that verse? That yeah. you were? Disturbed. Uh, my footnote says deceived. Uh, okay, I'm not quite sure about that. It's going to be in a good translation. I know the King James doesn't say disturbed. I think it says uh, moved. And that's a, a better one. The Greek word that's used there actually uh, means to like a dog wagging its tail. That's literally what the Greek word means there. As a matter of fact, um, I mean, that goes back to Homer, you know, the Greek writer. He uses the same Greek word, and tra it's translated, you know, a dog wagging its tail. Now, that's not always, you know, dogs don't always just wag their tail when they're happy. They can, but the idea is it's, it's constant movement, all right? Oh, one minute's here, next minute's there. One minute's here, the next minute's there, it's there. David wrote, Though the earth shall, mountains move into the sea, the earth be shaken, right? We shall not be moved. Right. We're supposed to be steadfast. We are supposed, supposed to be, to be steadfast, exactly. We're not supposed to be in constant movement in our faith. Right. Our faith is supposed to be steadfast. So in, um, through afflictions, we're supposed to be steadfast, right. not bouncing around. I, let me let me just say this, and I, I don't, again, please understand, I never say stuff for condemnation. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I say these for encouragement and to strengthen you. But it says let a man examine himself. That goes for you women too. Faith that is shaken is probably not faith at all. Never because faith, faith right. is, as it says in it's Hebrews, the it is the assurance. And if you have an assurance, nothing will shake it. You know, years ago, um, I pastored a church in Central Florida, mm -hmm. very, very close to one of the uh, one of a mega church that was pastored by one of the most famous, you know, televangelists in the world today, a, a real faith preacher and uh, a real quote unquote faith preacher. And I used to get the broken broken hearts and broken families that came out of that church because of poor teaching, because of bad teaching, where they were instructed that whatever they could believe in, they could have. 
a condemnation. Well, and, but that's not what the Word of God says. Yeah. You know, and that's not what faith is all about. You know, if you really study faith, Hebrews 11, you'll find that, and I use talk about this all the time, it says, Abraham, being the father of faith, it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Faith gives you the power to live Christ-like, to obey. And it's not about getting stuff. Faith gives you the power to give. It says, by faith, Abraham, Abel offered. It says, by faith, Moses, not considering the things of the world, things to be grasped, you know, he turned his back on Egypt and all the riches of Egypt, considering the sufferings of the people of God to be more desired. Faith gives you the power to give. Not, it's not about the power, power to get, right? Okay. So in this congregation, people would come out all the time because they had been led to believe things that were not true. So they would be shaken. Well, it wasn't, and they would come to me and talk about their faith being shaken. Well, their faith wasn't being shaken because it wasn't faith. It was positive thinking. And trust me, there's a gigantic difference between positive thinking and faith. The greatest example of positive thinking in the Bible is in the book of Isaiah when it talks about Satan. He says, I will, I will, I will. I will make myself like the Most High God. I will ascend to the man of the north. I will. He, he keeps talking about what he will do. And God said, oh, no, you won't. That's positive thinking. Faith is comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you hear, when you hear God speak to you, you will have an assurance because no promise that God has promised has failed to come to pass, and He watches over His word to perform it. That's right. So if your faith is shaken, you better examine whether it was based on what you heard from God or what somebody else told you or what you dreamt up in your own mind. That's when you need to pray, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And remember what I said now, when it talks about, when Paul is talking about afflictions, the afflictions, people don't come along and accuse you of being a good person. They don't come along and, and accuse you of being too good. Mm -hmm. the, the, the witnesses that come against you are always false witnesses. Isn't that, wasn't that true in the case of Jesus Christ? Right. Wasn't it true even back in the time of, of Jezebel? And Ahab, when they wanted to steal a plot of land, they brought false witnesses. Why? Because he's a liar by nature and the father of lies. Satan can't help but lie. So they don't accuse you of being good. They didn't accuse Paul of being a good preacher or being dedicated to... They accused him of being an enemy of the state. And that's what caused so many of the afflictions. The religious people were protecting their religious ground. Like I said, the Jewish people that rejected Jesus Christ were not spiritual. They were religious and political. Right? What afflictions did Paul suffer? Well, let's just look what here. Didn't he yeah, but I, oh, yeah. I mean, go to Corinthians and read that. You know, nights in the deep, beaten, times without number, jail. But let me just read you what we've already looked at here in Thessalonians. In, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, it, it, it says that he suffered and been mistreated in Philippi. In Philippi, remember, he'd been falsely accused, illegally beaten, and then he and Silas had been in prison unjustly, right? Mm -hmm. Beaten. He talks about his labor and hardship in, in chapter 2. He talks about how he was driven, driven out of Thessalonica in chapter 2. He talks about how he was hindered from speaking to the Gentiles in chapter 2. It's not so much the physical stuff. That's not what concerned Paul. I mean, you know, he talks about how, how he faced all this persecution. And then in, the, in his letter to the Corinthians, he says, but more than that was his concern for the churches. That's what Paul cared about. Paul didn't care about his own life. He took to heart those words of Jesus Christ, you know, to die, deny yourself. Be willing to die to yourself. For, for I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. This is what he said. To live as Christ, to die is gain. His life is not what mattered to him. His ministry in serving God and accomplishing God's purpose, finishing the race. That's what he says. That's what, what concerned him. You know, it, it is very painful to, to speak with somebody that you love oh. or know. And, and they're so deceived. That they reject out of hand the right. Word of God. Yes, That's very painful. Of course it is. If you, if you love somebody, 
I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. When you see, when you're somebody you love, you see turn their back on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or, or quote-unquote Christian, they turn their back on the Word of God. When you know that the Word of God is the only thing that can bring healing to their situation, whatever their situation is. But what can you do? You can't, you can't do it on their behalf. You can bring them the Word of God. You can bring them the good news. You can encourage them. But you can't do it for them. The choice is theirs. Paul says that he was destined to this. Destined. destined. Usually people are destined for good things. He well, was destined to be abused. He was destined for affliction. Yes. Well, he was. Yes, sir. We are, we are predestined, piloting. yes. It says in Romans chapter 8 that for whom God, God, whom for, God foreknew, for he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son Christ Jesus. That's the ultimate destiny of Paul. And I want to know something? God, God the potter was molding Paul and working on him throughout his life. The and that's why he... Set before him. Yes, for the joy set before him. And like Christ, that joy set before him was the people that his that's life right. touched. Right. So, you know, he, he has this. But in the world, he had a destiny. When... In the, the account in Acts chapter 9 of when Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. And now, God speaks to the man who has picked Paul up graciously and is taking him to his home because Paul is blind. And he was afraid to do that because of the reputation that Paul had. And he didn't want to do that. Ananias. Ananias didn't even want to take Paul to his home. But God spoke to him and here's what the Lord said about Paul. He is a chosen vessel, an instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That was his destiny. That was his destiny from the start. Mm. And God didn't send Paul out without showing him beforehand. You know, it says count the cost. A man came to Jesus Christ and said, oh, I'll follow you. And Jesus turned to him and said, listen, the birds of the air have nests, the foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You sure you want to do this? Count the cost. Count the cost. Before Paul was sent out by Jesus Christ, Christ showed him what he would have to suffer. Now, by the way, was that uncommon? What about with Peter? In, in, in John chapter 21, let me read you that, right? Jesus Christ said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he, Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. So before Jesus departs and sends Peter out, what is he? he gives him the good news. You're going to go where you don't want to go. And he showed him the kind of death he would suffer for the glory of God. And then says, follow me. This is not what you're going to see in the advertisements for most seminaries and Bible schools today. But you want to know something? God said this to Paul. God said this to Peter. But God said this to all of us. Through Peter, he said, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever heard in the Psalms, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Amen. Psalm 34, 19. If you have chosen to follow Jesus Christ, he, you know, it says in the Word, don't be surprised that the world hates you. It hated Jesus first. Paul wrote to Timothy, as he, before he sends him out to do all this work, or as he's doing it, 
and says in the last days, in the perilous last days, everybody who desires to live godly is going to be persecuted. Now, they're not going to persecute you for going into your church and do whatever you do on your church, on a, your church, that building you go to on a Sunday. And that's not what gets you persecuted. What gets you persecuted is taking your relationship with Jesus Christ outside that building and into the world and countering the culture of the world. If you love the world and the things of the world, you have not the love of the Father within you. That's the Word of God. If you make yourself a friend with the world, you've made yourself an enemy of God. That's the Word of God. You, you, you think that we can have peace with the world. Well, now, we should try to be at peace with all men as much as in our power. I'm not saying we go out and start... We're not supposed to look for trouble. And Paul will say that to the, to the Thessalonians. But the fact of the matter is, we are to go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We are to proclaim that life is eternal, and that there's only one person that can give you that eternal life, and his name is Jesus Christ. We are to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, and you can't get to the Father, you can't get to God the Father, except through Jesus Christ. No other way. And that upsets the world. Yes. There was an Old Testament prophet, and he went up to, I think, an Israeli king, and the king said, is that you, you troubler of Israel? That was Elijah and Ahab, yes. And it's just the opposite. You know, he looked at him like, I'm not the troubler of Israel. You are. But He's got this backwards. But, but, but he, but it he was, was true, and you got to understand this. When we bring the word of God... He troubled the trouble king of Israel, when you, when you, but he didn't well, trouble the God of Israel. When you... Troubling the people. He didn't... He didn't uh, Elijah, Ahab, Ahab didn't say to him, you're troubling the people. He just said, you're the troubler of Israel. Or He said, "You is that you, you troubler of Israel? I don't believe that you can be a prophet of God today without troubling the church. I don't believe you can do that. That's disturbing. Well, this is the purpose of prophets. The purpose of prophets is not to go out and tell you what a wonderful life you're going to have here on earth. I don't know, show me that. That's that's the Old Testament. Go look at these all these prophets in the Old Testament. God said they went out and they spoke, but not by me. They promised the wind. They go out and they make all these promises. And even in these days, these perilous last days, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, in the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine, but they'll accumulate for themselves teachers who will teach according to their own desires, who will tickle their ears. You know, people want to hear what they want to hear. The Word of God is contrary. The Word of God is confrontational. Contrary and confrontational. Why? Because it attacks the world. Why does it attack the world? Because today, even in the New Testament, after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, after the ascension of Jesus Christ, the Word of God says that this present world is in the power of the evil one. And it will be till you hear hoof beats in the sky and see the King of Kings on a white horse coming back. The church today is not going to take over the world. That's why Jesus Christ has to come back as a mighty warrior. Because right now, this present world is in the power of the evil one. When we go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ, when we go out and say that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, we are confronting the world and the world system. And by the way, you see, we, we have such a difficult time understanding this because we're like the first people. Historically, you know, a hundred years, a couple hundred years is not, in the scheme of things, is not a lot of time. And everybody bucket. talks about America being, oh, watch here, we're going to, a, a Christian nation. All the nations before were Christian. England was a Christian nation. France was a Christian nation. Germany was a Christian. They all considered them Christian nations. America became the first nation that set people free from religion. It was not about being free to practice your religion as much as it was being free from religion. So you didn't have to practice. No. Practice whatever you want. No. One of the things that's hard, because we've been in that system for 200 years and more, is today we don't understand how, go back a couple hundred years, how religion and was tied into daily life and the lives of everybody. Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, the Gallup poll, the most recent Gallup poll, still shows that 90% of the people in America believe in God. 
we'll be. Yeah. You know, one of the things the Word of God says that even the demons believe. Start you know, asking things more things. specific questions. Yeah. All right. But the fact of the matter is, if you went back to the time of Paul, 100% of the people believed in God. And look at everybody Evan, believed in God. Look at Evan and Paul. He, even the Romans did. Even the Greeks yeah. did. But you had your, back then, you had your choice of gods. You want to know something? You still got your choice of gods today. That's right. And when we go out and attack that world system by bringing the Word of God, I, you know, I, this is an expression I, I used, I think, here last week. And boy, is it true! When you do that, you're stepping on the tail of the serpent. Serpent. You stepping on that old snake. Snake. And when you do, he will turn around and bite. That's what snakes do. The Christians that are not being troubled by the devil, brother, you you better examine what's going on in your life. If you don't present any threat to the devil, maybe that's why the devil's leaving you alone. But we need, we need to be imitating Paul. This is what the Word of God says. We are to imitate Paul even as he imitated Christ. He is a man who turned the world upside down. You know why? Because the world right now is wrong side up. The world right now is wrong side up. Authority comes from the bottom up. Everything is upside down. We need to get to that place where we are obeying, seeking the Word of God, seek the Word of God. The Word made flesh who dwelt among us. And His revelation through his written, inspired word, God-breathed word, as to what our lives are supposed to look like. This was hard back then. And they're, and they're going out to live their faith caused affliction. If you go out today to live your faith, not seeking trouble, uh, uh, you know what? You're going to find trouble. Trouble will find you. I was just going to say that... Um uh, people today, they do good works and they feel satisfied in that. But the good works have no power. What no. they need, the word is the only thing that has power to do anything, to change anything. The message of Satan they're is always afraid, been right. They're afraid to share the word. Right. Religion is based on good works. Yes. And, and you can see that on the plains of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel was built. When men came together to do a work, and that work was to build a tower that would get them into heaven on their own. That was the beginning of organized religion. Right? And that Babylonian religion has infected everything right up until this day. Which is why if you go into the book of Revelation, you will still see Babylon mentioned over and over. Satan's not going to bother It's still there. Well, but the, but the fact is that if you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have been predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You have been destined, because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, to live in eternity in the presence of God, in the glory of God, in the joy of God. But here on this planet, don't be surprised at the world hates you. Don't be surprised at the trouble, at the fiery arrows that come upon you. This is why we're warned about this over and over and over, that these attacks will come. But, like that verse, but God will give us victory. That Paul, in spite of all he went through, said that he walked always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. I'm writing that book right now. I'm still working on that book. Getting there. The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. Because it's not about the devil. It's about Jesus Christ. And the Lord has given, sent word that he wants you to finish Yes, he it. has. So, that's what I'm doing. That's right. So pray for me as I work on that book. I want to get that out, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll probably send out uh, it's three basic sections of the book, and I'll probably send out the first section very shortly to some people. So if you'd like to find out about that, write to me, office at BibleTalk.com. And until then, what we're going to do is we're going to close and Jesus. come back again next week to go on in our study of Paul's letter. So Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for that gift of your son, Christ Jesus, Father. We thank you for faithful men like Paul, who served you with a heart like yours, Lord God, with such a burning desire to see lives touched by your love 
by your word. Help us to have that same burning desire within our lives, Lord God, that we would share you, that we would share that good news in this time of chaos all around us. Help us to proclaim that good order that your son Christ Jesus brought into the world. Oh, so long ago. Lord, we just love you and thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. God bless you. Until next time, we'll see you then. Is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet.